Give me massages. <laughs> Give good massages. Don't be upset because you like it. female figure? Women's lib? No one had ever done it before? Why not? Um, I'm not sure I have to have that call. Yeah, she's very successful. I'll see you later. Um, well, at the time, since she was a woman, the idea was that women were of, like, they didn't have as much stature as men, so they were more like a blank slate, so that gave her the advantage of applying the allegory to herself. Yeah, women were alle allegorized often because they were the blank slate. Um, so men were not allegories because a man is a specific person, and you have to wonder what you did all day, etc. You'd be a person. Uh, but painting, but he can't quite, you know, take it all the way, basically. And what is allegorical about, how do we know that Armin Jankowski is the allegory painting? Yes? The necklace. the necklace, yes. Does anyone remember what that conveyed? What's that? Yeah, it has a little face down here. Yes? The, was it the ma like for masking or... Yeah, imitation. Yeah, yeah, because the mask is sort of the imitation of the face. So this shows that the painter is skilled in imitation. Yes. The sleeve. This what? The sleeve. The sleeve. What about them? Uh, they're very detailed. Yes. 
Yes, there's this idea of changing drapery. That was also part of the allegory of painting. And what did that show about the painter? Dress up as St. Paul. Um, this here we have 
act, uh, you know, actually a group portrait of individuals um, exactly drawn from nature. Yes. Counter Reformation music. The Catholic Church 
groups under a lot of pressure to keep people in the church. Don't let them leave. They can't leave. Uh, Heighten their trauma. Bring it home to them. That's what counter-reformation painting is about. Which, if you're doing the second paper topic, you have you know, counter-reformation uh, painting to look at. Um, so, we were also talking about Ruben. Again, Ruben is a painting sort of for a very wide audience, not only painting for people in Antwerp, which is where he made his home, which is in Flanders, present day Belgium, but he's also painting for Mary de Medici, who was the regent of France. She was ruling France uh, when her husband, Henry IV, was assassinated. Um, and she's been ruling France because her son, Louis XIII, is too young to become king yet. So she's sort of ruling France de facto. And um, she commissioned Ruben to do this enormous, you know, about 20-something portraits, illustrating her life. Um, starting, of course, you know, with, you know, one of the main things is, of course, Henry uh, falling in love with her at the sight of her portrait. Uh, and this didn't, of course, actually happen. So that sort of this fantasy world, a uh, very different thing from like what Caravaggio is not about the fantasy world, um, or Velasquez is not very much about the fantasy world. Uh, two portraits, say. We have Henry, uh, we have Mary Medici, and he's combining it with all of this extra stuff. So he's elevating sort of the art of portraiture into this history painting framework, where we see, um, oh, there we go, so we have two portraits, uh, but we also see all of these gods, mythological gods. Uh, we have God of Cuban and Hyman, uh, love and marriage presenting this portrait. Uh, we have the figure of France, again, we know from Fleur de Lis, and we have Jupiter and Juno looking on quite clean at the arrangement that's happening below. So Ruben is really confusing sort of the drama and mythology with the sort of uh, kind of invented real life events, but this idea of the betrothal of Mary de Medici to Henry. Uh, and there it uh, You can see how this figure has been identified as France because of the Fleur de Lis, which is the symbol of the French royalty. Uh, here we have the arrival of Mary de Medici when she comes. Um, again, uh, these, these mythological figures are sort of enhancing uh, the historical import of what's happening before us. Because maybe this isn't very exciting of a moment, she's getting off a boat, right? But with the way Rubens reconceived this idea is that she's greeted by, here we see the trumpets of fame, um, the, the daughters of Neptune, and so all of these mythological trappings Uh, 
Um, we see books being trampled upon. Uh, Mars is literally kind of stepping on you know, the whole knowledge, the rational knowledge of the world is being you know, undone. Uh, we see a mother and her child, uh, you know, babies are gonna die, war is terrible, etc. So here, oh, here we have the close-ups. So we see, again, sort of this connection, all of these bodies, as uh, with rays of the cross, all of these bodies are kind of working together to form a cohesive canvas. Um, so here we see, again, Venus, uh, her child, her son, Cupid, <coughs> the love in war is sort of vanquished, right? When, when love and war cannot coexist. So as Mars sort of trumps forward with this idea of war, um, you know, Venus is going to be uh, pushed aside. Uh, so they have this look where they're connected also by this red drapery. Uh, red perhaps for blood and war, but also for love and um, good things. Uh, so dynamically, Rubens has decided to have this red drapery connecting these two opposites, love and war. Um, so there's that there, you can see sort of the hand. Rubens was uh, very interesting for not trying to hide the painterliness of paint. Um, and this became, you know, when you look at the lost head, it's all very smooth. Um, you don't get a sense that there are brush strokes involved. But Rubens' technique is much looser. You can see that this is about paint. He's not necessarily trying to cover that over. He's giving us this very kind of, uh, that it all gel together in the bigger picture. But he's not going to hide the fact that this isn't a photograph. Of course, the photograph has not been invented yet, so that's a bad analogy. But when you look at the last guys, you will not see brush brush <coughs> When you look at Rubens, you are, you know, confronted with brush strokes. Uh, again, these looks sort of exchanging between them, but ultimately it's about uh, the bodies. Here, again, Rubens, this is on the left side of the painting, where this woman is sort of uh, beseeching the god, you know, please don't go to war, and we can see sort of the teardrop. Still, a very loose, loose style. There's nothing that's not going to tell us this is, this is very overtly about oil paint. When you look at a Van Eyck, you're not going to see brush strokes. But when you look at Rubens, you're going to see brush strokes. Um, Rubens also did uh, personal paint uh, portraits. Uh, this is the artist and his wife, his first wife, Isabella Brandt. And unlike a lot of more formal portraits, uh, Rubens, well, first of all, how is Rubens portraying himself? Classy guy. How do we know he's classy? His wardrobe alone, yes, tells us that Rubens is really, really rich. Um, so he's not showing himself as a painter. He's showing himself as, you know, almost a horrific act, basically. He has a uh, lovely tights, he has his nice legs.
Philip IV in the castle, Rubens actually had this huge sort of estate uh, in Antwerp, which ended up sort of functioning as a factory for painting. Because how was Rubens able to be so prolific? Part of the way he did this was because he would actually hire on uh, different artists who were specialists in different things. Uh, so you have an artist like Rubens who specializes in the overall uh, composition and he does the bodies. But then you get an artist um, here, like this is a collaboration with Jan Bruegel, and Jan Bruegel is really good at doing still life. So he works for Rubens and builds in all the still lifes of Rubens' painting. Then you get somebody, um, other artists who specialize in faces. You get other artists who specialize in landscape. So working together, a lot of Rubens' paintings are actually a collaboration. It's not just Rubens. Rubens sort of you know, gets his name on the end product. But he's actually sort of, uh, through that use of oil sketch, remember we looked at oil sketches last time, Rubens would sort of conceive of what the painting should look like, uh, maybe come in and do the bodies, and then a lot of times other people would really fill in those details. Uh, and this was half the time always going on at Rubens' home, which is had a studio as well as you know, living quarters and things like that. Uh, so Rubens was actually what you know very set up almost his own studio, you know, major, major sort of production. It's not like a guild, but it's, it's Rubens' own personal thing. Uh, and this is in part how he becomes so successful because he's utilized the skill of other painters as well. So this is the collaboration here with Paul Rubens and Jan Boyle. Um, allegory in sight. This was one of five. This, uh, and they were commissioned to do uh, all the senses. <coughs> this one is the sight one. Where, which part do you think Rubens is? The body. The body, yes. And Bruegel? <laughs> A lot of other stuff. Yeah. So we get sort of, again, this collaboration where they're actually, because it's the allegory of sight, they're actually kind of been commissioned to do a painting. It's a painting about paintings, really, about the collection of what they do. Um, where you can see Rubens actually, the, the body is done by Rubens, um, but he's also referencing a lot of his earlier works, uh, which were owned by this guy. So this is actually up in the upper corner. He's referencing Daniel in the lion's den. Um, here, that's this painting right here, the lion and tiger hunt. So this is also a painting by Rubens, almost about Rubens, too. This is very much about his collection. Actually, if you go back here, this painting also was a collaboration between Rubens and Bruegel. Which part do you think Rubens did? <coughs> no, Rubens did not do the flowers. Oh, the two bodies? Yeah, the two oh, bodies. Yeah, and Bruegel would have done uh, the, the outside in the, in the original real painting. So these are all sort of real paintings owned uh, by this man. And we also see, sorry, so then, see, in the foreground side, uh, we see uh, these figures, Cupid, um, looking again, showing what sight is about by looking uh, again at a painting. So here is the portrait of uh, this person's collection. So he, of course, got to be it too. We see all of these different instruments of sight around them. We see a telescope, uh, we see different lenses. Uh, we see also this monkey kind of looking at, um, at this painting with like a magnifying glass. And part of the reason that that monkey is in there is to sort of show the limitations of sight, or the idea that even a fool, you know, who can physically see, will not really see. Um, so we have all of these ideas of how to represent sight throughout, not only just by painting, but through these various instruments, um, and also by collecting lots and lots of works. Um, so, as I mentioned, Rubens employed all of these artists, uh, work on this 
It's about the cohesive composition. Um, and you don't get as much focus on faces. all about that really strong back. It's about the way the light hits that back as uh, Samson is slumped over in Delilah's lap. It's about the drapery. It's about all of these things that are creating that drama. With Van Dyke, we get a lot more facial expression, a lot more people, actually, too. And it's not as cohesive as... Uh, of a composition. Things are in disarray, things are happening. The dog perhaps symbolizes fidelity. It's not peacefully sleeping, but up and around and around, like something bad's going on. Uh, so anyway, this is sort of where uh, Van Dyke comes from, is he learns from being in the studio. And then he eventually sort of graduates, to use a weird term, but he then eventually sort of gets going on his own, and, um, and he becomes the court painter for Charles um, who is shown here, and actually who was knighted by Charles Burr. What uh, did Anthony Van, did Charles Burr like about, uh, sorry, what did Charles like about Anthony Van Dyke's painting is that um, we see sort of a very kind of, well, this is a king, right? But how do we know that he's a king? Is there anything that would tell us specifically that he's a king? The sword of the sand. Maybe the sword and the sash, yeah, but there's nothing, he's not wearing a throne, you know, he's not, sorry, he's not wearing a crown, and he's not with, like, elegant, amazing robes, yeah? What did you say, the mustache? The mustache. <laughs> you have to be able to grow a baby hair of a king? <laughs> yeah? Not think about it. Well, he's not quite a regular person, but he's this king. So sure of himself, perhaps, that he doesn't have to be all you know blinked out. He's okay, the thing is show him hunting, right? He doesn't have to, he's so self-assured, perhaps he can show himself as a regular person. Um, so that's partly what sort of some of the power of this work is, is that Van Dyck is showing him just like a regular guy, not just a regular guy, but a regular noble guy, hunting. He's not in all of the trappings of royalty. Sense of 
masculinity under the idea that you stand out by yourself, you like hunt by yourself, in which case the other one where you have a whole, like you're fanning out in the whole entourage. It's true, Charles still has his whole entourage with him. Velazquez paints uh, Philip IV as standing alone as this brave individual, a man and his dog, yes? Seems like uh, Van Dyck is putting detail throughout, whereas Velazquez is more detail than just him and the dog. Absolutely, good, good point. Van Dyck is using detail throughout the entire painting, whereas Velazquez only concentrates in detail on Philip IV. You know, what's going on in this landscape? It's like completely, you know, it, it, it becomes almost sketch, a sketch of a landscape. Whereas with Van Dyck, there, we have detail until the last darn thing. Uh, Van Dyck is very, because, this is partly, I think, because he was trained in portraiture. It's very detailed. It's about capturing that fidelity to nature. Um, whereas Velazquez is more interested in, like, banging on his picture of Philip IV, and it doesn't really matter. You know, stick, stick Philip IV in front of a blank background. Um, so there's a difference in sort of the focus of the painting. Any other thoughts in comparison? Well, this is sort of what it was like to be a court painter. This is sort of why this week is called the age of absolutism. Because we've been looking at a lot of paintings where of, of kings and rulers who are showing their authority and showing their power through painting. Why painting, of course? Because painting was, oh, we'll come back to that. Um, because painting was about uh, propaganda. This was the way that people even figured out, sorry, how Philip IV looked or how Charles IV looked. <coughs> Uh, these paintings were kind of smaller copies would be distributed, prints would be made of them, and you had to have court painters, and you had to sort of demonstrate your power over and over and over again. Uh, before we leave Flanders, uh, this is Clara Cajun. She uh, is a woman, and she was doing um, small, still life paintings. So we see, um, for this will come back again when, next week when we do the Dutch Republic and Dutch paintings, the paintings of the North. Um, this interest in the still life, this interest in sort of the smaller things of the world and how they relate to each other. She was very, she was actually unique in that she combined flower painting with uh, food painting, two separate things. Here they are combined in the same picture plane. Uh, she's also showing us um, pretzel uh, that comes from the Latin word for reward because uh, children would get these uh, salt and treats as rewards for learning their prayers. So the pencil is supposed to look like a child with his arms sort of crossed in prayer. Um, so she's giving us, again, sort of, you can see even Caravaggio's influence in a still life painting. So even the drama is still kind of being heightened in something perhaps rather mundane as still life, as things that are on your counter, on the tabletop. Uh, but we still get that, that dark, dark contrast of bright light, dark, uh, dark shadows. Uh, that interest also in the things of the world that we saw with Velazquez um, about how, and, and actually really Caravaggio too, coming out of the still life tradition to create these bigger dramatic history paintings. Um, okay, then we're going to go to France. This is our last stop on our tour of absolute rule. Um, so we've been in Spain, and we were in uh, Flanders, now, now we're in France. Um, and this is Louis XIV, um, who became known as the Sun King, who ruled France as the longest um, running ruler of any European country. Um, I think it was over 50, 60 years that he um, was king of France. And he also, again, uses these portrait paintings as propaganda to show the king's authority, to show, you know, power over all of the land. Uh, because of course you have to, you know, we're getting to a point where two weeks we're gonna have to have uh, where they're gonna open up the king and hand the king. Uh, because people are, you know, you really have to convince them that you should be king of all friends, not them. Um, so of course this is to do this, you know, Louis invoked this divine right of kings. It was the idea that uh, God had made him king, not chance. Uh, not hereditary, not just the happenstance of being born into it, but that God had divine that Louis XIV should be king. Um, so how is Louis XIV sort of associating himself with power here? What's powerful about this? The sword. The sword. We see the sword, yeah? The sword. 
might sound a bit ridiculous, but since we're pulling out of like the 17th century and moving right into 18th, there's still the idea, the use of wigs, but with this image you have Louis the 14th with a natural like black hair. In other words, he has this, like it's the aspect of, you can apply it to how like a lion has a mane and that's a sense of dominance, but for Louis, like it kind of shows his youthful side as, as a ruler as opposed to being some old yeah. Well, he was at this point 63, so he yeah. was pretty old. Yeah, but he's not painted with the body of a 63. Exactly, that's the thing. Yeah, absolutely. He has like flowing black mane of hair. Not probably factual. Yeah. Um, he's wearing shoes that make him taller. Yes, he was also very short. The theme of all these rulers, and <laughs> he was five four. Again, we have Velasquez. Okay, this is what these court painters were often commissioned to do at the time. 
power and wealth. Um, so we have these are the mirrors. Um, on the other side, the mirrors are sort of mimicked by windows. Yes. Were back then mirrors in general expensive? Or yes. No, mirrors in general were expensive. And to have this size of mirror is all about very expensive. Uh, so it's enhancing this. Interestingly, uh, he gets, again, Charles Lebrun, who becomes his court, uh, court painter, actually, um, to design this tall mirror and, well, and paint these paintings on the ceiling. Uh, but each of these mirrors here is uh, mimicked or paralleled by a window on the other side. So we have this enhancement of the light. <coughs> Uh, coming through the windows and then being reflected off the mirrors. Um, this very grand hallway. And on the ceiling, oh, we'll get back to that. On the ceiling, sorry, I'm trying to talk about Charles LeBron too. Charles LeBron is sort of, uh, becomes Louis XIV's court painter. And this is um, a portrait of him by somebody else. But, Uh, 
I'll, I'll explain like Kusani after the page of Kusan, who we're about to look at in like five minutes. Um, so, there, so these are sort of the types of paintings that LeBron is doing. He's very, very interested in the level of detail. He's interested in this level of detail. He does lectures on facial expressions. Now, here's the problem. Can we tell facial expressions in these big grand history paintings? No. Now, LeBron is very interested. You know, he's interested in the craft of drawing. He's interested in how you evoke emotion. And he thinks an emotion should be evoked in the face. Um, on the other hand, that is not very suitable for these large scale history paintings that he's been commissioned to do. When we're looking at these paintings that he's doing, you know, for Louis XIV, it's kind of hard to tell what's happening. Remember, it's happening on the ceiling. Like, you don't really get close enough to see what's going on at the level of facial expression. And so this is sort of, if we can compare, again, Rubens to Lebrun, what, are you, what do you notice about these two? Yes. Well, I think that almost Ruben was, Ruben was using the expressions more than uh, LeBrun was. Probably the one side, the expression of Christ's face. Is it about the expression of Christ's face or the, the position of Christ's body? I'm just saying, it's supposed to go by. That would mean that there's a lot more people with their back to this. Yeah, but what we see a lot here with Ruben is that these bodies are all sort of working to do things, right? There, there's sort of a cohesive action that all of these bodies together are taking. We can't necessarily, we sort of see that Christ is sort of looking up, but I wouldn't even necessarily say we could establish what the particular expression on his face is. But what Rubens is interested in how all of these bodies come together in this overall composition. Whereas here, I would say we're faced with what? How can we compare the treatment of death? Level of the facial expression. 
And Rubens would say it's about the bodies expressing things. Um, and that's how you get the back row, because the back row is going to be able to see those expressions. Um, so back to sort of your side, this great house topic, this is where LeBron really uh, gets, we see a lot of his work, um, successful or not. There are also these amazing fountains going on, this acres and acres and acres of gardens, the fountains closest to the palace would be on all day, but the other fountains that were like way off miles in the distance would only be turned on if Louis XIV decided that he might take a walk out of the other gardens. Um, and of course, Louis XIV wanted fresh. Um, he always wanted to walk in the summer garden, so the French Navy would always be bringing him summer plants. So even the death of winter, he could walk them on a summer garden, not a cold uh, winter garden. So again, incredibly elaborate. You can just think of the banquets every night they were out here. You know, it's like a four hour dinner every night. And at midnight, you have to appear at the costume ball, and et cetera, et cetera, and then he sleeps till noon, obviously. And it's a very lovely life, except that everyone was bored and you know, tired after all of this. Poor thing. Um, but this is sort of this is a fountain at her side. Yeah. 
again wants it to be about order and down to the level of drawing. Uh, this is Poussin's uh, famous painting at the Arcadia Ego, where this group of shepherds is sort of um, in this sort of paradise, and even in Arcadia, um, what they're looking at is um, sort of a coffin, and it says that even in paradise, I am here, even in paradise, death is here. Uh, so here we have again this sort of classical lesson that Poussin uh, is trying to convey to the viewer, where we have again. Um, not much. 